These are a bunch of random objects, and when I toss them in the air, they seem to wobble. They follow weird, strange paths. But watch what happens when I put them against a dark background with a fluorescent dot at a special place on the object. Now they follow smooth, perfectly curved paths. It's like they don't even have any shape anymore. That is weird and eerie. Hey, I'm Diana Cowan, and welcome to lesson 14 of Diana's intro physics class, also known as AP Physics One Review, also known as Physics by Diana. In today's lesson, we're gonna figure out where on the objects I put those dots. What is that special place for the dots? That's actually just a tiny piece of today's lesson. It's whatever. The cool thing that we're doing today is to understand spinning things, which are everywhere. You are on a spinning earth and you don't even feel it. We're gonna figure out why you don't feel it. And we're also gonna figure out why doorknobs are at the edge of a door and not in the middle like hobbit doors. Today's topic is complicated. So we've ignored it up until now, but we're finally going to approach the tools you need to describe rotational motion and we're gonna describe how you make things spin. So today is rotation and torque. And today's theme is you spin me right round, baby, right round. And if you were paying attention, then you're saying, Diana, hey, you've already done that theme in lesson seven with circular motion. And you're right, I messed up because that lesson was actually about going around in a circle, like running around in a circle. And today is about things spinning and rotating. It's different, my sincerest apologies. So let's start with that earth question. Have you ever thought about it? How fast you're spinning around on earth's surface? how fast Earth is spinning you around on its surface. We know that Earth is rotating because of insane time lapses of the sky like this. But how fast is it rotating? Let's work it out. Can I have a pin? I got it. And the purpose of doing this problem is actually to learn that asking how fast are you going around isn't a great question because you can answer it in two ways. How fast are you moving if you were just running around the Earth, like the linear speed, or how fast is Earth rotating, like revolutions per second? In this problem, you're gonna learn the difference between those two, and you'll also learn basic tools like radians and angular speed. So, what do we mean by how fast? Well, speed is a distance per time, meters per second. If I'm standing on the equator, here's Earth, and here's me on the equator. The radius of Earth is really close to 6380 kilometers and circumference is 2 pi r so that gives us a circumference of about 40,100 kilometers and we want a velocity which is a distance per time so i'm going my circumference in one day that's how long it takes me to go around but i need to know in seconds so that's my distance 40,100 kilometers per day but in seconds one day is 86,400 seconds. Tattoo it on your body. This is 40,100 kilometers, which is 40,100,000 meters. So this works out to be 464 meters per second. That's about a thousand miles an hour. But I'm actually not standing at the equator. I'm in California at a latitude of about 32 degrees north. So if I did some trigonometry to figure out my actual distance to Earth's rotational axis, then it's about four fifths of the radius of the equator. So I'm actually going about 800 miles an hour right now, or 400 meters per second right now, that way, because that's east. But wait, this is my linear speed. Lesson seven, Diana would be very proud of us. But lesson 14, Diana is talking about something different, about rotations. How fast am I rotating? And we're gonna need a new tool. Our linear velocity was defined as our change in distance over change in time. And that was in meters per second. And we want an analog to that for circular motion. We call that rotational velocity, omega, which is a Greek letter. And it equals the change in angle over change in time. This is an analog for circular instead of linear motion. And we measure it in radians per second. Why radians? Because radians make the math way easier to deal with. So what is my angular velocity? Well, I do one rotation per day. Done. But I want it in terms of radians per second, so not quite done. One rotation per day is two pi radians. 
per day. And we know the number of seconds in a day because you have it tattooed on your body now. So that's 86,400 seconds. So that works out to 0.0000727 radians per second or 7.27 times 10 to the minus five radians per second. That's my angular velocity. That seems small. It is kind of hard to imagine 0.00727 radians per second and what that means. But it makes a little more sense if you relate this angular velocity to our linear velocity. So let's do that with a little unit conversion. We have our angular velocity, 7.27 times 10 to the minus five radians per second. And I'm gonna do a unit conversion here. So we traveled one circumference, two pi r, every revolution around, which in radians is two pi radians. My two pi's cancel, my radians cancel. And I get 7.27 times 10 to the minus five. I've still got a one over seconds here times my r, my radius, which is the same radius as above, 6.3 eight times 10 to the sixth meters. That's the radius of Earth. And that equals, do out this math, you get 464 meters per second. And we're back. And what we did here was omega times, this was our radius, equals velocity. So we are spinning around the Earth going at a thousand miles an hour. If the Earth were a hamster wheel, then you'd have to run at a thousand miles an hour to keep it going. That's really fast. And that point zero 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 seven two seven radians per second, that turns out to be exactly half the angular velocity of the shorthand of a clock. What a coincidence. So another useful tool we can introduce here is to convert angular velocity to linear velocity. And you just multiply omega times r to get velocity. Oh, hey, we just did that. So this is the key to converting back and forth between the linear world and the angular world. You multiply by r. And there are also angular analogs to linear displacement. So you would multiply theta. So theta times r equals s. It could be x, but we'll use s for displacement. Often we write displacement as s. And then the analog for acceleration is our angular acceleration, alpha, and that times r gives you your linear acceleration. So same relationship for displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Angle, angular velocity, and angular acceleration. And we're done with our first problem. This relationship that we figured out in this problem between linear and rotational motion can make rotational motion a lot easier to understand. So let's use these relationships for more problems. Okay, here's an example. Here's a classic problem, a bug sitting on a spinning record. So imagine there's a bug, this is record spinning, a bug's on the edge and it's clinging for dear life. And we wanna figure out the friction force keeping the bug there. We need some numbers. Okay, so I have this record player spinning some groovy tunes at 45 RPMs, revolutions per minute. So my record is spinning around 45 times a minute. And that's how many revolutions per second? 45 revolutions per minute. There's actually only three fourths or 0.75 revolutions per second, which gives us an angular velocity of three pi over two radians per second. That's our angular velocity. I don't have a bug, but I do have a cute little spherical cat sitting on the edge of the record. So here's my cat, meow, and it's at a radius of about 10 centimeters. And we need to know the cat's mass. The, the mass of the cat is about 500 grams or 0.5 kilograms. And we've got all of our numbers. Now we know that objects only move in circles if a force is acting on them. In this case, that force must be the friction force between the cat and the record pointing along the path of the cat. No, I was just testing you. The friction force is pointing inward. I know it seems weird. It seems like the friction should be dragging the cat along, but the friction force is pointing towards the center of the circle, not along the circle. So the question is, what friction force does the cat feel? Let's dig out an equation from our circular motion lesson. So the cat's traveling in a circle, so the sum of the forces on it are, are centripetal force, 
are going to be mv squared over r. This is what you remember from your circular motion lesson. And there's only one force. There's only the friction force pushing the cat inward. So I'm just going to set this to my force of friction. So now I've got two options to calculate that force. I could convert my angular velocity into linear velocity and plug that in here. Or I could do something way cooler. We already know now that an object's linear velocity, v, is its angular velocity times the radius r, times the distance from the axis of rotation out to the cat, or r. So let's plug that in to our centripetal force equation. So we get force of friction equals this v is squared, and then I get an r, two r's on the top and one on the bottom that cancels, and I end up getting m omega squared r. And that is my centripetal force. Now I have an equation for the centripetal force law in terms of angular velocity, m omega squared r. Same thing, but now I can calculate the force due to friction directly from the angular speed. So plugging in the cat's mass, I get 0.5 kilograms times my omega squared, which is 3 pi over 2 radians per second. Square that, and my radius was 10 centimeters. We want it in meters, obviously, and that's 0.1 meters. Work that all out, and I get a force of 1.1 newtons. Ta-da! So we just figured out the friction force by pulling in our centripetal force equation, but using our circular motion tool to solve this without needing to know the linear velocity. So now we've related rotational motion to centripetal force, which means we can now answer the big question. Why don't we feel any centripetal or centrifugal force while we're standing on this rotating Earth? Let's model it. Here's my Earth. I'm rotating at the equator. And so I must have some centripetal force inward keeping me going in a circle. That centripetal force will be the sum of Earth's gravitational force inward and the normal force pushing on me outward. I could measure that normal force with a scale, and we know gravity's force is just mg, but we're gonna do it by just thinking through it carefully. If we weren't rotating, then the normal force would just equal gravity's force. They have to balance out so that I don't fall through the Earth's surface or shoot out into space. But because I am rotating, then the sum of the two forces must equal m omega squared r. And because we know the gravitational force between me and Earth isn't changing, that means the normal force, or the number on the scale, must be reading a different number, a smaller normal force. And it's smaller by exactly m omega squared r. So let's work it out with my mass, which is about 60 kilograms. My omega squared, we worked that out in the last problem. <laughs> it's this one. So it's about 7.3 times 10 to the minus 5 radians per second. Running out of space times 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. This is the radius of the Earth. And we get that this equals about 2 newtons. So we get a reduction in the normal force by about 2 newtons. That's like taking away 0.2 kilograms of my mass, which is about a third of a percent. That's crazy. That means if the Earth stopped rotating, you would actually weigh more by an amount that's more than I would have thought, but it's still not enough that you can feel it. That's cool. And that's why you can't feel the Earth rotating. So we're basically done introducing the tools that we need for circular motion, but there's another key concept we have to introduce today. And I'm gonna do it by asking a fundamental question. How do I get something to rotate? The way that I get things to move in the linear world is to apply a force to them, and that makes things accelerate. But in the rotational world, I spin things. But spin is not a very physics-y word. So, the physics analog to the linear force in the rotational world is rotational torque. And our symbol for torque is the Greek letter tau. This is a new big concept. And a little aside, torque is one of my favorite physics concepts ever. Applying a torque to spinning objects can give you the craziest motion. Like if you spin an egg, you can make it stand up because of torque. Or this tippy top that plops upside down when you spin it. Torque is what leads to gyroscopic motion and precession, like this wheel hanging on a string would normally just fall straight down. But if I spin it and hang it from the string, it'll turn around in circles on its own. So strange. Moving on. Have you ever thought about opening a door? I mean, really thought about it. How do doors work? And this is how you know we're really physicists, when we ask how doors work. 
So I open a door by turning and pushing on the handle, and then I shut it by pulling on the handle. I am changing the angular speed of the door. I am angularly accelerating it. I am torquing it. But why is the handle out here? In Lord of the Rings movies, they stick the handle on the hobbit houses in the middle. But just try to push open a door from the middle, and then try it from the side. It's definitely harder to push it from the middle. It's almost impossible to push it open from right here. And if I push it next to the hinge, it won't move at all. Clearly, as I move away from the axis of rotation, I'm able to torque it more easily. In fact, the definition of torque is the force that you exert on an object times the distance from the axis of rotation to where you exert that force, or R. Except there's a little caveat, because check it out. I'm gonna push on a door a meter from my axis of rotation, and no matter how hard I push, there's no rotation. That's because I'm pushing into the axis of rotation. But if I push perpendicular to the axis or at a slight angle, it does move. So clearly the force has, has to have some perpendicular component. Here's my axis of rotation. Here's my radius. Say I wanna rotate this pen around here and I wanna apply some force. So here's my force. So torque is the perpendicular component of that force times R. So to calculate that perpendicular component, you multiply the force by sine of theta. And if you're confused about which angle is theta, one way to remember it is to use the extreme behavior method that we've used before. So think about uh, when this torque would be zero. Sine of zero equals zero, and that's the minimum value that we're ever gonna get. And that's when my force is this way along the radius. And then if I move this all the way to 90 degrees, or pi over two radians, and I get sine of theta equals one, which is the maximum. So you maximize the torque when you push at an angle theta of pi over two. And so then here, right here is my angle theta. So over here, it's this one. This is how we define torque. Another great way to get a handle on how torque works is to think about a teeter-totter. So pretend I'm a cute little five-year-old sitting here ready to go. And along comes this fifth grader on the varsity tetherball team who weighs three times what I weigh. Wah wah. The seesaw is not going anywhere. It's so sad when that happens. But what if we move the fulcrum? Here's a photo of my high school physics teacher lifting a bunch of eighth graders using the same concept. So back to our example. Clearly, if we move the fulcrum and we put it here, it doesn't work. We know it needs to move over here somewhere toward the fifth grader to balance out. But why? It's because we're both trying to torque the seesaw around that fulcrum. Gravity pushes down on me with a force of my mass m times g, and tetherball champion Marie pulls down on her with a force of three times that, so three mg. And I am trying to torque the seesaw around some distance x in one direction, and then she's torquing it in the other direction some distance from the fulcrum equal to the length of my seesaw, we'll call that L minus X. So this is L minus X. So we wanna balance the two torques, which means we need to satisfy this equation where my torque equals her torque. And we can use this equation, which is gonna have distances in it, to solve for where to put the fulcrum. So my torque, force times R, is gonna be my, the force of gravity, mg, times the distance, mgx. And her torque is gonna be her force of gravity, 3mg, times her distance, L minus x. So I've got mgx equals 3mg, L minus x. Now my mgs can cancel on both sides, and I get x equals 3L minus 3x. Bring the 3x to this side and I get 4x equals 3L or x equals 3 fourths L. So in order to balance your torques, I should put the fulcrum 3 fourths of the length. Draw my teeter-totter again. Whoa. So in order to balance my teeter-totter, I should put the fulcrum 3 fourths of the way. Oh, there's like a half, there's like 3 fourths three-fourths of the length of the seesaw away from me and one-quarter of the length away from her. And the place that we put the fulcrum is actually the center of mass of this whole seesaw system with me and the tetherball player. Remember the little dot on the rotating objects at the beginning of this lesson? Turns out, if objects are freely spinning, they will naturally spin around their center of mass. That is where I put the dots. And it's easy to see this for symmetrical objects like a record or a disc 
because the center of mass is just at the center of the disk. But even non-symmetric objects that spin all wobbly will spin around their center of mass. And I can easily find the center of mass of something that's not symmetric. By doing that finger balance trick, just move my fingers in. Ah, cool. And I'm finding a place where all of the torques from gravity pulling on all the little atomic pieces of my hammer balance out. That's really cool. So one more torque example. I'm going to try to make one final incredibly mundane object interesting to you. screwdrivers. We know they work. But it's not like a screwdriver has a big long lever arm that you can torque. It's just a little plastic handle and yet it makes removing screws easy as pie. But I challenge you to use torque to help us understand why screwdrivers work. What direction is my hand applying the force on the screwdriver? It might not be immediately obvious but as I wrap my hand around the handle the flesh of my hand drags along the surface, applying a force tangentially. So the force is all tangential to the direction of rotation. So I'm applying some force tangentially. So the force is all tangential to the direction of rotation. And it's some distance away from the center of the screwdriver. It's small, so it's about one centimeter out. So force in a distance, that's a torque. So my torque is some force. I don't know what magnitude, times a centimeter, or 0 0.01 meters. And that same torque gets applied to the screw down here. But the screw rotates a tiny radius. Look how tiny. The average radius from the center of the screw to where the screwdriver is in contact with the screw head is around half a millimeter, or 0 0.0005 meters. So that means my torque here, which is going to be the same, is torque of my screw is F screw times 0 0.0005 meters. So work out the math and you get that force of the screw over, oh, this is going to be cool, force of my hand equals 20 over 1. So the force the screw feels is 20 times the force from my hand. That's as if I had a hand that's 20 times stronger than it is. I wonder if there's a human that could apply 20 times, pro probably. <laughs> so that means a screwdriver is actually a force multiplier. It multiplies the strength of my hand and arm by 20. And it does this with no moving parts, with nothing but simple torque, which is really cool. So the real lesson here is, if you're bored, you clearly aren't looking close enough at screwdrivers and thinking about how they work. And that, that's our lesson today on torque. When they ask you what you learned on YouTube today, here are your two key takeaways. Rotational problems are just linear problems with a radius. And torque makes things spin. It's just a force at a radius. And as always, here are the problems we did in today's lesson, and I highly recommend you go do them at home because that is the best way to actually learn physics. And now here's some crazy physics. Special relativity which is a branch of physics, says that moving objects contract. Like, for example, if you flew close to the speed of light head first, you would actually become noticeably shorter. So today, we talked about records and stuff spinning with the assumption that they're these rigid, solid objects. But do you ever think that objects can be completely solid? Totally rigid? Well, back in 1909, a physicist named Paul Ehrenfest proved that according to special relativity, a truly rigid object does not exist. It's impossible because of that concept in special relativity. You move, you contract, although the contraction isn't noticeable to us unless you get close to the speed of light. So think about a spinning record. You got different parts of the object going at different speeds, which means different amounts of contraction. And that means that the object would have to twist. So Ehrenfest made this geometrical argument that objects can never be truly rigid. And if you continue on with physics and take a class in relativity, you'll come to fully understand why that is. I hope you do continue on with physics. And now, a message from a special guest. Hi there, my name is Diana El Cindy. I'm a propulsion engineer that works on rockets and rocket engines. If you continue to study physics, you might be able to take the next human to Mars or build the next rocket to the moon. Good luck.